Hello everybody and uh, it's time for another expert interview. So this time we're going to be talking about the Civil Air Patrol and I have with me a special guest once again all the way across the pond. So uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself, let everyone know who you are. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dr. Frank Blazic. I am a curator of military history at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. And in my copious free time, I am also the National Historian Emeritus of the Civil Air Patrol and the founder and director of the Colonel Louisa S. Morse Center for Civil Air Patrol History, located at Joint Base Anacostia Bowling in Washington, DC. Which would make sense as to why you know so much about the Civil Air Patrol. So um, as per the, uh, the standard format for these kinds of things, we've got 10 questions lined up. And uh, once again, it will be, uh, I ask the questions and <laughs> the expert does most of the talking. Um, so I guess first thing to start off with is, the Civil Air Patrol, where did it originate from and why was it set up in the first place? Simple questions, of course. So the Civil Air Patrol, its immediate history really can be traced back to the summer of 1936, when a gentleman named Gil Rob Wilson, who was the New Jersey Director of Aviation, took the Hindenburg and actually went over to Germany. And, and the Reich Air Ministry basically allowed Wilson, who was an aviation expert in the United States, to kind of tour what Germany's aviation developments, if you will, not necessarily all of the military developments, but its aviation developments. And in particular, he observed the Hitler Youth gliding organizations and saw how the Germans were basically trying to develop this concept of air mindedness in their youth. He very quickly read between the lines and said, mm, this isn't just for good, healthy youth youthful fun, this is really to train the legions for the Luftwaffe and the future conflict to come. Uh, Wilson returns to the United States and immediately begins to kind of develop this idea that we need to do something in the United States with civil aviation, particularly light aviation, as well as youth, to turn these into a viable resource for the nation's uh, military benefit. Uh, not and or if not say for direct military usage can you harness the civil, the civil aviation resources and make them an asset for local government as well as emergency officials to respond to say natural disasters or, or health crises and so forth and so on wilson has this idea he, he reaches out to the red cross with it the american red cross and here's nothing the idea doesn't die with wilson however because in 1938 in Ohio, a gentleman named Milton Knight was a, a glass company executive. He and several family members and friends will incorporate something called the Civilian Air Reserve. Their idea with this organization is to take civilian amateur pilots, if you will, and essentially try to train them up so that they could be potential military aviators, or at least this pool of pilots that could serve in a feeder system for the military. Fast forward then to 1940 and 41, you're going to see an another, another organization with the AOPA, they'll develop something called the Air Guard. And the Air Guard is similar. It's, can we take uh, these civilian pilots and prepare them for potential military usage to feed into the, the kind of pilot stream, if you will, for the Army aviation as well as Naval aviation. But all of these are ideas, all of these are small efforts. There's really no consistent national effort until about May 1941, and specifically May 20th, when President Franklin Roosevelt will issue an executive order establishing the Office of Civilian Defense. Now, some of the ideas of this American effort will be taken from the British civil, civil defense effort in the Second World War, but LaGuardia, uh, Fio, excuse me, Fiorel LaGuardia, who will be named director of this new Office of Civilian Defense, is himself a World War I aviator and uh, was on the Italian front. It flew in Italian, he's there on the Italian front with the Army Air Forces. Good, getting way ahead of myself, mm -hmm. the Army Air Services, excuse me, uh, advising Italian, Ital Italian aviators. And LaGuardia has always kept his hand in aviation uh, after, after the First World War. And several influential gentlemen in the United States, again at Thomas Beck, as well as Gil Rob Wilson, will essentially approach LaGuardia with this idea 
to put forth a proposal to create an organization for civil for basically taking civil aviation and folding it into the civilian defense effort. And on June 25th, 1941, they'll present him with a plan for what they call the civil air defense services. And this plan is essentially going to focus on a youth component and predominantly an educational component to bring together as much as possible the civil, the civil aviation resources of the United States and prepare these resources for both civilian defense use and potentially military use. But this idea is kind of, they have the plan, but LaGuardia doesn't really act on it. At the same token, there's another component in play here, and that's the military itself, uh, specifically the Army Air Forces under then Major General Henry H. Hap Arnold. And Hap Arnold, by I think this is about uh, July of 1941, will go on record as basically saying that the organiza organization of existing private flying resources, the keyword here is existing, is highly desirable from a national defense standpoint. Arnold's all for using uh, civil aviation if it can benefit the military, provided it does not take away from a military buildup. That's the key. That's why I say the key here is existing resources. He says he doesn't want to devote new resources to them. Use what you already have. So we continue to fast forward. Uh, by late summer, their army is going to convene an informal board to decide we have this, uh, there's a civilian air reserve is still out and about. In fact, the civil uh, the CAA is considering using it for a nationwide plan, taking Knight's idea and developing this in, into a wider nationwide plan. You then also have AOPA's Air Guard. And Wilson, by summer of 41, has taken this civil air defense services plan that went to LaGuardia and launched it in New Jersey almost as a trial model. So you have all these different pieces, all under different names, not a lot of organization coordination. The Army looks at all these informally, and they decide, there's something here. We should do something. From that, in about August of 1941, that is when the ball really gets rolling, that the Office of Civilian Defense will step in, and out of that will, be, will develop this idea, of, and this idea, and then later this organization of the Civil Air Patrol to organize essentially existing civil aviation resources for national defense purposes, in a nutshell. A very long-winded answer for a very simple no, Fair question. enough, no. Well, it's, it, if it's got complex origins, it requires a complex answer. So I guess once the Civil Air Patrol is official, um, what is its defined role at that point, given that all these various ideas have sort of been funneled into it? Well, when CAP is, a, is a officially established in early December of 1941. And, and even our founding date is a confusing factor because we'd like to say we're founded on December 1st, 41, before American entry in the war, but the legal administrative document, which is signed, dates to 8 December 41. So we'll just, for all the intents and purposes here, we'll say early December 41. When we're stood up, it's essentially a paper organization. Now there are some states and for clarity here of the listeners, a state civil air patrol organization is referred to as a wing. So there are some states and wings that do exist, but they're not of the civil air patrol model. They might be civilian air reserve. They might be the civil air defense services. Uh, they might be, I've seen civil air guard. They might be air guard. It's, it's just a jumble. Under the CAP model, however, governors are going to appoint into all men, they're all of the air, unfortunately, all, all white men, to run these respective wings. And they will then begin to pull together the resources that exist, either these already established organizations to fold them under the Civil Air Patrol moniker and model, or to reach out and basically recruit pilots, uh, recruit aircraft owners, recruit interested persons who would like to volunteer and do something. An added bonus, if you will, is that this is taking place in December 41. The United States has just entered the war. There's a lot of patriotic fervor and a lot of men and women want to do something. And civil air patrol, if say you're ineligible for military service because of the physical infirmities or age or gender, CAP offers a chance to do something and to contribute to the war effort. So most of December and 41 into January 42, CAP is really just forming. 
it's just or, pulling people together, creating squadrons in local communities, organizing these squadrons into groups, uh, figuring there's no real uniforms at this point. There's barely any insignia. Uh, there's we're, everything's being built from scratch from an administrative bureaucratic standpoint. And so it's, I don't want to use this analogy, it's the Wild West, but as an organization, it's simply not fully formed. But the, there's a lot of energy and there's a lot of eagerness to do something. So some of the very early missions of the CAP units across the nation are simply guarding airports, providing security uh, because there were fears, of course, that enemy aircraft, or excuse me, civilian aircraft would be somehow stolen by fifth columnists or used for nefarious purposes. So airports are being guarded. Blackouts are Americans were convinced potentially uh, Japanese carriers. Perhaps the Graf Zeppelin would seem across the Atlantic in an attempt to launch strikes against New York. Uh, so, so people are concerned of air attacks. So CAP personnel will go up an aircraft to spot for blackouts and test you know, the effectiveness of them. They'll be flying over vital war industries just to provide eyes in the skies. They'll remove air markings. There was a period where the rooftops of buildings in a lot of communities would be marked, indicating where an airport was or the direction of an adjacent town. Again, an interest to avoid sabotage or any type of espionage. These markings had to be obliterated. So CAP members participated in that. Spotting of forest fires was an, was an operation that early CAP members participated in, as well as searching for scrap metal and just flying and looking for junkyards or uh, resources that could be used in the war effort and training civilian defense volunteers, one of CAP's very early purposes. So we would f conduct mock air raids and fly, and, you know, fly over communities, sometimes mm -hmm. dropping sacks of flour. Uh, we could be dropping leaflets, warning people that could have been a raid. If you'd seen something, you should have reported it. And so these are the kind of simple, but yes, useful missions that CAP is gonna engage in early in our development. Okay, and what kind of aircraft are they using to do this? Do they have sort of ex-military stuff, maybe stuff that's just been retired, or is it whatever they happen to have on hand? <laughs> it is all civilian, so there's there's really no former military aircraft. There probably was a Curtis Jenny or two, a former trainer from the First World War. Probably the the mm -hmm. are we had one or two early on, but essentially, and and I have researched specifically on the anti-submarine mission of CAP, which we'll get to. But in that, we're gonna, in that effort alone, we had over two dozen different airframes and uh, manufacturers. And just to rattle off a, a couple of names, we had Aranka, Beechcraft, Belanca, Yule, Cessna, Culver, Curtis, Fairchild, Fleet, Fleetwings, Grumman, Harlow, Howard, Luska, Monaco, Piper, Ruwing, Ryan, Sikorsky, Stinson, Taylor Craft, Waco, and probably a partridge in a pear tree if it could fly. <laughs> Literally any person who owned an aircraft uh, could offer it for civil air patrol use. And so really uh, Wilson's vision, like can we harness the, the existing resources, came to fruition. It, if it could fly and if it could serve a useful purpose, a member's aircraft could fly in CAP. Now, the, the, the larger aircraft, the more powerful aircraft, uh, CAP was specifically interested in these uh, later on in the 42 and 43 because these aircraft could handle a military type mission. They either could carry the equipment that were that was essential for this mission, or they had the kind of strength and endurance. Because again, these civilian planes are they're designed really for kind of joy flying or casual flying. They're not designed for the the day in, day out sortie generation that you're going to see with the military airframe. And that can, can and will become a problem as the amount of flying CAP conducts increases over the course of the war. Okay, so they've got this weird batch of random aircraft. They're, they're still trying to decide what they're actually supposed to be doing, all these different roles. So overall, what is the state of the civil air patrol as the sort of the first months of the war develop? Are they are they trying to homogenize into smaller numbers of aircraft, or, or what, what's happening? So the the big thing that really will transform civil air patrol is in January of 1942, when five German U-boats decide to 
pay a visit to North America and begin what is known as a, a, a Operation Drumbeat or a Polkenschlag. But this, this appearance of German U-boats, particularly off the American Eastern seaboard and American waters, extremely close to shore, is a great shock, not just to the American people, but particularly to the United States military, the, the Navy Department and the War Department. The, the biggest struggle here is that the, the Navy is shorthanded. We loaned our, our cousins across the Atlantic, a, a large number of destroyers. <laughs> uh, another large asset of our surface forces were just sent to the bottom of the Pacific or are on the run, if you will, think of the Asiatic fleet. And so the Navy just doesn't really have the resources to launch a large sustained patrol a series of deterrence patrols along the eastern seaboard. But coupled with that, the Army Air Force is, quite frankly, is shorthanded. They also do not have enough aircraft to keep eyes over wide swaths of the, of the ocean at a given time. It's wonderful if you can send a single B-17 up and down the coast, but all a submarine, a wise submarine commander would have to do is go, oh, there he is. Okay, he's gone by. Then they can continue on their merry way. What was essentially needed then was to place large numbers of aircraft and ships into the shipping lanes and to keep a consistent patrol, uh, essentially aerial surveillance and 24-7 uh, if you could, but, but at least during daylight hours. CAP will enter the breach as this asset. We, we have these civil, we, we have this organization, they have aircraft, they have flyers, competent civil flyers. The military is understandably reluctant they're saying, well, you know, I don't know about these folks. They, they're really, they're brand new. We don't know how they'll perform under pressure. We don't know if they can operate independently in the sense that we're not having to constantly rescue them from the ocean, or respond to distress calls, or deal with a bunch of false uh, contact reports. Beginning in February of 42, but late February, uh, CAP will establish these two anti-submarine bases one at Atlantic City, New Jersey, and the second at Rehoboth, Delaware. And the second base at Rehoboth will actually launch its first anti-submarine patrols on March 5th, 1942. So not that far removed from when CAP first began formally. From these initial two bases, the CAP will eventually expand by September of 42 to have 21 anti-submarine patrol bases stretching all the way from Maine down to the Texas-Mexico border. And all of this operation, to a great extent, really is built from scratch. A lot of the, the, the buildings, in some cases, are literally uh, built by the CAP volunteers themselves. In several instances, they felled their own trees and ran their own lumber mills to get the lumber necessary to build their hangars and offices, as, as absurd as that may sound. But it happened. And they want and these and they were very dedicated to this, despite being paid really just a small per diem per day. Folks were also not uh, were also not uh, free from selective service, the draft. So if they needed, if they were called into military service, they could be. But once this coastal patrol or anti-submarine operation came into being in early '42, that really aided CAP's development. Because what it did was it demonstrated that CAP is a, is a valuable resource that will serve the nation's military needs. The military is going to, particularly the War Department, is going to provide funding to CAP. Because again, all of this is volunteer. It's really, a, there's a joke in the organization today, CAP is come and pay. Mm -hmm. what it stands for. Uh, I don't subscribe to that attitude, but it does exist. But there's some truth in that, and that it goes all the way back to World War II. But as a, as this kind of inchoate idea, because of having a mission, the mission will enable CAP to really crystallize and form and professionalize. Semi-militarize, as I really argue, is what will come out of this operation. And so by the summer of 42, again, not far removed from when the organization began, CAP is being approached by the War Department to conduct a, a, a wider number of active duty missions in direct support of the Army and the Army's needs. In many cases, uh, replacing Army units, which is something that the Coastal Patrol did. It was able to take Army observation squadrons 
and free them to then prepare for overseas service, either in Europe or the Pacific, replacing military personnel with civilian volunteers, conducting essentially military operations. And it's really a unique, in, in America's military history, this is probably, the, 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 at least in modern military history, really a unique example that's, that's not what I would say using contractors in the mm. contemporary sense, but rather these are civilian volunteers referred to it by many folks as uh, Minutemen, in a slight nod to the disagreement that uh, the United Kingdom and mm. colonies had back in the late 18th century. But that's really who they were. And it's, it's if you give people a mission and you give them a need, they can sometimes amaze you with how quickly they can organize themselves and focus their efforts in a professional fashion. And that's really what CAP did in the summer of 42. Okay, fair enough. So you mentioned they established these uh, sort of almost two dozen anti-submarine bases. Uh, presumably they're getting some funding to do that. How, how much are they expanding total in terms of bases and also aircraft? Okay, so, so the bases, as I said, we have these first two, they're, they're established in, I think, 28 February 42. They begin their operations on 5 and 10 March, respectively. And these will, and the bases will continue to emerge into September of 42. Essentially, as the U-boats, as, as U-boat operations shift from kind of the, uh, I guess you could say the northeast sea, seaboard of the United States, they kind of move southward into the Gulf of Mexico. As the U-boats move south, the CAP bases will begin to expand, as well as uh, Army and Navy operations as well, right, to, to, to destroy and deter the U-boats. The bases initially are only 59 personnel. They're very small, and they have 15 pilots and observers and 15 aircraft. But what this doesn't really take into account is wastage of aircraft. Again, this early in the war, you have spare parts. Because you don't have many bases, you really get the creme de la creme of, of, of airframe and engine mechanics and pilots and observers. But as the war continues, People are going to be drafted or they're going to enlist, they're just going to volunteer and enlist in the military. Aircraft are going to break down. And so by late August of 42, the bases are going to increase in number. I think it's up to 78 personnel. And in some cases, they will exceed that. They also no longer say you have to have 15 aircraft. They say you have to have 15 pilots and observers. But there's no limit on the number of aircraft. And that's quite frankly because they're running out. Uh, the CAP aircraft, as I said, these are cloth skinned, tubular aluminum or steel aircraft. They're, they're not military grade planes. And flying over the ocean, we have instances of pilots flying over 40 hours a week. Uh, the, the aircraft are just going to break. They're going to fall apart. And no amount of creativity will eventually save you from the fact that you're flying an unsafe aircraft up to 60 miles out over open ocean. And your navigation consists of compass, watch, and the Mark I eyeball, you're really limited in, in, from a safety factor. And, and so this issue of wastage, which, which doesn't really appear early in 42, becomes a dire crisis uh, by early fall of 1942, to the point that there was a call to shut down this whole operation, quite frankly, because people were dying. The, the planes couldn't be repaired safely. They couldn't acquire spare parts. Personnel were getting burned out and exhausted uh, from the work. And perhaps uh, most importantly, they didn't have any safety equipment. The, the military did issue formal instructions to all of these bases, and they would always say, well, you have to have, must fly with a life raft, must fly with a life preserver. But the military wouldn't issue anything. And that's one of the interesting factors here is initially, all of this was out of pocket by the volunteers. To this day, CAP members purchased their own uniforms, uh, but in World War II, they were providing their own planes. There were no military provided planes. The military was not providing any maintenance. What they would provide is a per diem, uh, and they would provide funds to cover operations. So we would think oil, POL, petroleum oil lubricants, as well as certain maintenance costs. But pretty much everything else was out of pocket for the CAP members. The organization itself could not provide funding. The funds didn't exist eventually the War Department will fund 95% of the operation. In addition to that, uh, several oil companies in the United States literally 
ponied up about forty thousand dollars, and these monies were distributed the penny ante to some of the bases just to help basic costs. Literally, in some cases, keep people from being evicted to pay the rent on buildings or to cover, say, the electric bill. Getting ahead of myself, jumping all over the place. I, I was oh. just going to I was just going to mention just just for the viewers, so Sorry. forty thousand dollars in World War II U.S. money is a lot more than it might sound today because uh, the exchange rate's about four dollars to the pound at that point so you're talking about uh, ten thousand pounds now when you consider that a spitfire is about five thousand pounds so you're talking about the price of two top of the line fighters at that point now obviously there's not a direct correlation with a modern f-22 or an f-35 or a typhoon because they're a lot more complex these days but it still represents a considerable amount of money that, that, that they're putting up. It's not kind of pocket change. Absolutely. absolutely. And a, a fun perspective here. So the, the Coastal Patrol bases, when they initially were conceived, uh, if I can get my, get my data up here, they were calculating that they would roughly cost um, about $20,000 a month to, to operate. And this is covering the per diem cost maintenance and everything else. Now the cost of a single B-17 Flying Fortress was three hundred and one thousand dollars, about nineteen thirty-nine to forty-one. Mm -hmm. uh, by forty-five, they get that down to one hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars. The consolidated B-24 Liberator cost three hundred seventy-nine thousand dollars. So one can quickly see that the CAP is a is a bargain. I mean, this, this is cheap deterrence. It, it 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 it's very cost effective, uh, and that holds true today, uh, jumping ahead here, but the contemporary civil air patrol uh, flies Cessna 172s and, and predominantly 182s. It, it costs us something like uh, $165 to $180 per hour of flight time. Compare that, say, to a drone aircraft, which can easily extend into the, the thousands, up to say tens of thousands of dollars per flight hour. Because again, the CAP, you're not paying the air crew. You're really just paying for your POL and your maintenance on the aircraft. So then and now, it's a considerable bargain for the military to use CAP. The forty thousand dollars for the oil companies is what's what would be the apropos expression here? A drop in the barrel, mm -hmm. considering the loss of their tankers. And they really decided, and they pushed the use of CAP for basically anti-submarine uh, aerial patrol, deterrence patrols, because they said. You know, the military is not helping us. Our ships are getting torpedoed. Our crews are jumping ship because they don't want to sail because they're afraid that the, the ship is undefended and it'll immediately get sunk. Mm -hmm. We need help. And it was, in fact, Sun Oil Company, or today Sunoco, they proposed up to $10,000. In I think it was February 4, 42, they said, mm -hmm. we'll give you $10,000 just to set up an experimental patrol to, es to essentially show the military that this will work. Right, this homework. Yeah. And Sun Oil will really be kind of the leader in all of this uh, early on to, to, to pull the other oil companies together to get the resources to help supplement CAP. You're taking our question, I know. <laughs> it's all right. it, it, well, it, 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 but... it, it gives an idea of the scale of the money we're talking about because yes. yeah, forty thousand, ten thousand, forty thousand dollars, it's a lot, it's a lot of money for the period. It's a lot more money than most people will would ever see. But at the same time, as you say, the stakes are how valuable is an entire tanker full of fuel? Uh, that's a whole other level beyond that. Again, I mean, I suppose you could kind of think even today, if you think about what's the price of a military helicopter, or even what's the price of an F-22 or an F-35, and then you look at the amounts of money that are being thrown about with this whole Suez Canal issue, exactly. and it's orders of magnitude again more. And when you're the one who's paying that bill repeatedly because you're losing ship after ship after ship all of a sudden shaking loose a few tens of thousands of dollars to try and stop that doesn't seem so so bad to deal not at all not so bad at all but uh anyway i don't know where else we've got we'd like to take that question in terms of the expansion in, in the, the bases and aircraft but suffice to say long story short as as we demonstrate that these patrols work uh mm -hmm. in the sense that they can fly uh, professionally, they, they semi-militarized, they free up military assets. The Navy, who was uh, under Admiral King, was extremely uh, reluctant, uh, almost dismissive of CAP. 
under Vice Admiral Adolphus Andrews on the Eastern Sea Frontier, Andrews loves CAP, he thinks this is fantastic, eventually gains operational control of the CAP units, as well as the Army resources there in, in the Sea Frontier. And the Navy will work hand in hand with CAP, as will the Army. And so these civilians, this untried, unknown uh, commodity, eventually becomes part of the team, if you will. And so they're going to expand, they're going to expand, expand. But the problem is this funding issue that the military loves them. We want to use them. However, we're not going to put the funds or the resources into growing and sustaining. You. You're going to have to, as Arnold said, use the existing resources. And eventually by uh, late October, early November, 42, things basically have to come to a screeching halt where the military says, okay, we haven't had many, we haven't had any sinkings. And, off the East Coast or in the Gulf of Mexico from U-boats. Uh, from all intelligence data, the U-boats really aren't patrolling anymore in, in mass off the United States coast. So we're gonna curtail flying hours. We're gonna tell CAP, you know, don't fly as much, uh, work on your bases, work on maintenance, work on drill, educate yourselves, right? Further professionalize yourselves in the semi-military bases. Uh, and that's what, and that is essentially what CAP will do. Uh, mm -hmm. and but we'll, we'll still begin to lose some personnel uh, due to accidents, due to air, aircraft, essentially aircraft fatigue, pilot fatigue. And, but by early 43, the survival equipment that's so vitally needed, both life rafts, uh, life preservers, in some cases, very early survival suits uh, that, that we see used you know, that are, uh, I, I think, federal law and international law you know, are mandatory uh, for, for commercial fishing and other industries. These will actually even be issued to some of the CAP units. So they finally get this military support that they've been told they had to have from day one. They really don't get until early 43. And, and as such, it, it's, and I'm probably jumping ahead here, it, it's kind of a, a tragedy in a sense that by summer 43, the CAP Coastal Patrol operation is really at its acme. Uh, the bases are in their best shape they could be. The, the training, the, the CFP members are also finally going to get formal military anti-submarine training and, and be taken through uh, military courses. They're the most best trained, uh, best bases, the aircraft maintenance, they finally really resolved a lot of the problems. They have armed these aircraft. In fact, the CFP planes were actually armed beginning in May of 42. So it's not just civilians flying their own planes out of the ocean, but now they're flying their own planes with Uncle Sam's bombs and the authority to use them if they see something. They, they've become this asset to the, to the armed forces. And it's right in the summer of 43 that the military says, it's been fun, but on 31 August 43, you're shutting down. You're not gonna do any more patrols. So by about July 43, they're, they're at this ACME and that's when they're told no more, right? The Navy's gonna take this over. We don't need you guys anymore. Okay. so. In that kind of, I guess, relatively short not year and a half or so that they're really going for full bore, how successful was the CAP? Were there any particularly notable successes that they had uh, with regards to their primary mission? They, for the longest time, uh, CAP always claimed that they damaged or destroyed two enemy submarines. And the assumption here with German U boats. I, I conducted the research and no. We, we did not sink anything. We probably and absolutely bombed and likely killed a whale or two, which we're not proud of. And hopefully Greenpeace won't listen to this and come out. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, we joined the ranks of the Army and the Navy and almost every other anti-submarine organization in killing a whale or two in the course of the war. We, there are likely incidents, and it's difficult reading uh, the U boat war, war patrol diaries, as well as CAP records, which are basically non existent for the 21 bases. We have only fragments of patrol records. But essentially, they did what the, their main job was to deter. It was not to sink submarines, to find, fix, and kill subs. It was to deter them, to, to be the eyes of the home skies out over the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico, so that if any submarine attempted an attack or even wanted to do recce, and look around and see you know, what was the traffic, there would be aircraft overhead. We, we performed those missions and we performed them extremely well. We 
conducted over 5,000 special convoy missions at the request of the Navy. I think we flew almost 250,000 miles and we only lost 90 aircraft and 26 individuals killed. And unfortunately for the record, these 26 are not considered veterans under US law. So these are 26 civilians that gave their lives for the nation's well-being during the war. But we kept the gray wolves at bay. Uh, sinkings on the east and Gulf coasts declined, decreased, and essentially ceased, at least during the period that CAP was operational, March of 42 to August of 43. And perhaps most importantly, we demonstrated that these, the civilian aviation community is a viable resource for national defense purposes. It, it's not a flash in the pan. The men and women of the Civil Air Patrol absolutely could function as a semi-military organization to supplement, in some cases replace, uh, military units for military service or military missions. And the Coast Patrol mission is really going to spawn uh, several other aspects of CAP's usage. The most direct one is we flew border patrol missions along the U.S.-Mexican border uh, beginning in late 1942, and that was the direct spinoff of the Coastal Patrol operation, replacing Army units and having to patrol and guard the border with CAP personnel. And we performed that mission admirably well into I think, late 43 and early 44. We also would conduct uh, target towing missions, again, freeing up military personnel. We would either be the targets for searchlight crews, or we would tow uh, canvas drogue sleeves uh, for uh, anti-aircraft gunnery training. So CAP would perform those missions. To free up further resources for the military, we conducted courier operations. So we would actually have aircraft at various stations throughout the United States that could ferry uh, vital supplies to the war industry, perhaps military personnel, perhaps records. Uh, it could be medicine or, or whatnot. That was another mission that we conducted to great effect. Into 44 and 45, we began to engage in missing aircraft search missions for the US military. Again, a lot, of, a lot of military aircraft flying, you're gonna have accidents, you're gonna have crashes. So why tie down military resources when you have CAP personnel who can fly, who can fly out over the terrain? In many cases are more familiar with the terrain because they live there and they fly over these areas on a regular basis. In all instances, it's fulfilling our purpose. We're freeing up uniform military personnel and assets that are needed in theaters in Europe and the Pacific and taking care of these matters domestically with domestic resources. It's, it's on, on a tax basis, CAP is a fantastic return on investment. And that's just a fraction, and mind you, of what we did. I could rattle off a whole number here of the kind of strange missions we would do. Uh, well, I suppose that's, that, that's the next kind of question was what right. other things did they do besides you know, Coast Patrol? I mean, you mentioned ferrying documents and stuff, but you know, the, there's a, if there's a lot of other things they were doing. So here, here's, here's just a fraction. Uh, we, we conducted aircraft radio calibration flights, radar calibration and training missions. We would do emergency relief uh, for floods, blizzards, hurricanes, or other uh, tornadoes, uh, railroad wrecks, actually, in some cases. Emergency medical flights, uh, be it transporting medicine, uh, plasma, or supplies, or medical personnel. We would transport civilian defense and military officials to inspect uh, both war industry camouflage, uh, blackouts, or other defense-related work. I know there was there were efforts with the Office of Strategic Services to use CAP for uh, aerial communication purposes. I haven't even found the full files; it only had snippets. But somehow we were involved in signals work for them. We would do promotional flights for war bond drives, uh, flights for state and multiple agencies. In October of 1942, we launched a cadet program to basically take young men and women in their final two years of high school here in the United States and prepare them essentially for possible military service. And that program continues on to this day. And it's a great conduit to introduce young men and women to essentially a military lifestyle, at least this concept of uniform service. And many of these individuals will go on into not just the United States Air Force, but the other branches of the military. Other wartime missions, uh, we did recruiting drives for the Women's uh, Army Corps, the women's branch of the United States Army and the Armed Forces in general. 
we patrolled lakes and rivers uh, to report on ice conditions in the Great Lakes. Uh, we would assist with the training of state guard units. So while the state national guards were nationalized and went overseas, they were essentially state militias in some cases that came up and CAP assisted with their training. Some of the wackier things we did, we conducted aerial hunts of wolves and coyotes destroying livestock. So game hunting from, from the air with a rifle is, is not necessarily a new pastime for some individuals. We were doing this back in World War II. The slow speed of the, of the aircraft we were flying actually enabling people to successfully shoot coyotes or wolves that were preying on livestock. We tracked fugitives from justice uh, for state and federal law enforcement agencies. There was uh, CAP uh, assisted in the hunt for uh, German prisoners who had escaped from prison camps in Arizona. I think uh, Papago Park, 44 or 45. I know CAP was engaged with that. Uh, the Japanese balloon bombs that had, were using the uh, uh, high altitude currents to kind of cross over the Pacific, CAP was involved in looking for these and it, 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 not really shooting them down in this instance, but if we spotted them, uh, reporting them to military officials and or if they were spotted on the ground guarding these areas before the military could come and uh, take the equipment away. We also herded wildfowl by air to prevent crop destruction. So thinking too of uh, food will win the war, CAP was involved in, in these kind of operations to safeguard the nation's uh, agricultural industries and, and livestock industries to provide the rations needed, not just by the American military, but of course, by uh, all the allied forces. That's, that's just a fraction. I mean, it, going through the surviving records, you, you continuously find the good idea fairy emerging and pulling out her wand and saying, let's do this, let's do that. And more often than not, CAP said, we can do it. And we did in the course of the war. Well, that's the thing. If you've got a bunch of, um qualified pilots and aircraft and you 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 need something done and it's not something that you can maybe turn around to the military and say can you bomb this or can you shoot this they're pretty much your, your go-to guys and, and, all, and as i said to cap we're, you know, we're as, as a resource we're cheap but the other advantage you could say is we were available whereas the military their their mission is very direct in what they need to accomplish and, and they had essentially finite resources to do it. CAP was this incredibly flexible uh, asset that is assigned to the states with a wing commander who's answerable to a governor. And so the biggest problem, or in many respects, the limiting factor on what CAP could do was and remains awareness that we do exist, that we have these resources, and that we're willing to always sit down and engage with anybody who comes to us with a proposal. What, what can you do or what can't you do? We, we like to joke to this day that we are the, the Air Force's best kept secret, which is, which is in some respects self, self-imposed self because we don't necessarily do enough uh, kind of marketing communication awareness that we're here and, and this is what we bring to the table. And that's why I, as a historian, decided to write a book about them and talk about them. So I, I guess uh, that leads us on to, I mean, we've discussed a lot of the individual bits and pieces that they did, but how important in aggregate were the CAP's efforts to the war effort in general? How, sort of how, much, how much did they save generally? How, how useful were they compared to if they just hadn't existed and people had to get on with things on just on land? It's difficult to really quantify uh, the contribution of civil air patrol. Part of that is because, quite frankly, the records don't exist. Because we're, you know, we're a semi-military organization, we're kind of a quasi-government organization. Of, for example, the Coastal Patrol ba uh, bases, we had 21 of them. Records only survive of one base, and it's, they're not even complete records. A lot of the files of the national organization, even the membership files of the Second World War, are all destroyed. They don't exist. So there's difficulty even in determining how many people did we actually have in uniform at any one time during the course of the war. We just don't know. But perhaps the best way to view it is we still exist. 
the success of Civil Air Patrol can, which I argue is based almost entirely on the success of this Coastal Patrol anti-submarine effort, really hinges on an executive order from April 29th, 1943, where President Franklin Roosevelt ordered the transfer of Civil Air Patrol from the Office of Civilian Defense to the War Department. The value in this is that in the summer of 45, then President Harry Truman, the Roosevelt passing in April, they said, why do we still have a civilian defense organization, right? Where's the threat? So he disbands the Office of Civilian Defense. But CAP, by having moved to the War Department, was safe. And in fact, CAP represents the only surviving element of the original Office of Civilian Defense from World War II. So here we are in the War Department, summer 45. By September, the war's over. What do you do at CAP? And in January of 46, the, the Hap Arnold and, and others essentially go to CAP's leadership going, well, folks, it's been fun, but the war's over and we don't need to fund you anymore. So good luck to you. What CAP will actually manage to accomplish is gain, uh, have congressional legislation passed and signed into law by President Truman, making us a corporation incorporating the Civil Air Patrol in uh, summer 1946. By 1948, CAP is also going to be legislated into, into law as the official civilian auxiliary, or I should say an auxiliary of the United States Air Force. And so essentially with, the, with these legislative and political legislative actions, that's an acknowledgement by the government that this organization to utilize the nation's civil aviation resources for national events purposes has value has a lasting value. They demonstrated during the war and it's a value we want to retain post-war for the foreseeable future. And 80 years later, we're still here, uh, still continuing to operate in every state in the United States, as well as uh, Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia. And we continue to fly uh, missions either in support of local communities or directly for, at the request of the United States military, mostly the United States Air Force but also in conjunction with the United States Army and the United States Navy. And hopefully, presumably, the space for... <laughs> if anyone has a civilian spacecraft that they can uh, lend a hand with. <laughs> I, I don't know if Mr. Musk would like to join us. He's welcome to. Uh, maybe he can tune into this program. You never know. Yeah, never know. Uh, given, as we said, they've got civilian aircraft, that they, they have issues with stuff wearing out. Was there anything that could have been done to improve the effectiveness? Uh, or were they generally well supplied? Well, they were. The, the, really, the only the only two items they were supplied with on a consistent basis by the military, and and not even consistently until late forty two into forty three, were was ordnance, uh, 100, 200, 250 pound general purpose bombs or three hundred twenty five pound depth bombs, or uh, survival equipment. And so in this case, it'd be uh, one-man life rafts, uh, May, West, May West life vests, uh, flare pistols, uh, CO2 cartridges to the vest. But that was really it. Uh, in terms, what, what you really would see in the records is that while there was not a formal supply system set up, some of the bases did have the advantage of having very friendly relations with a nearby army or navy installation. And, and conveniently, there were a lot of military installations nearby most of these bases. Uh, there's a fascinating example where the, the Coastal Patrol Base 4, which was in Parksley, Virginia, uh, Base 16 in Manio, North Carolina, and Base 21 in Beaufort, North Carolina, had aircraft featuring three-tone U.S. Navy camouflage, the same camouflage that Navy aircraft were using in the Atlantic. And that was because there was a friendly lieutenant up at the base of Norfolk, and he allowed the CAP aircraft to actually fly there, have maintenance using Navy, Navy personnel and Navy resources. And they even ran some of these aircraft through the paint booths. And so you got these civilian planes sporting CAP markings, but in Navy camouflage. And it's really kind of a, a unique, uh, essentially civil military relation example of, of the Navy recognizing the value of what CAP was doing and helping them kind of quietly under the table where they could. You, you see other examples where the army would loan equipment 
uh, they would say, you know, trucks, Jeeps, fuel trucks, and the like were loaned out to CAP bases. Sometimes weaponry, uh, there, there's a hand, I don't really have the, 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 the paper, the document, the, the documentary evidence, but I have photographic evidence. And you see CAP, CAP personnel with Thompson submachine guns or uh, M1903 uh, bolt action Springfield rifles or a uh, Model 1911 A1, you know, semi-automatic handguns. So in some cases, the firearms were issued to the CAP personnel who were the guards at these bases. So you, you, you occasionally see some military support, but it's not consistent. There's no really consistent policy until about May of 43, when CAP is being transferred to the War Department, then policies are promulgated to supply CAP operations. But the problem is the bases will close down before these resources are provided to them. And so you begin to see those difficulties. Uh, other you know, supply support came perhaps say, in the issue, the issue of uniforms, where CAP members had to purchase all their uniforms, but the military said, OK, we're going to allow you to purchase. You can go to our exchanges and you know, purchase some uniforms, or you can purchase uniforms, but you have to remove all the military insignia and use your own insignia. But on the uh, basic level of aircraft and bases, that was really up to CAP members uh, to, to, as I like to say, big borrow and air quote requisition what they could uh, to perform their missions. And it's absolutely true that, that particularly in Manio, North Carolina, they took law, trees that had in fact been cut down to build a naval auxiliary air station, dragged them to a nearby lumber mill cut their, planed their own boards, and then lugged it all back to the airport to build their hangar. Uh, there's other fantastic stories where uh, at the Grand Isle, Louisiana, the base was having difficulties because cattle were chewing the fabric off the sides of the aircraft. <laughs> As they didn't have a means, they didn't have barbed wire to keep the cattle away from the planes. And I, 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 it's so frustrating, I have a photograph showing cattle, a herd of cattle around a group of planes and that picture is barely an inch and a half by like an inch and it's very dirty and fingerprint mm. you know, smeared. I've tried digitally enhancing it. It just doesn't come out crisp enough for publication. Uh, and in that same base, their runway was basically 20 feet uh, from the Gulf of Mexico. So they had flooding issues and they didn't really have a hangar at first. So they took a telephone pole and they would stretch canvas over it and that became the hangar to do maintenance, so, yeah, complex engine repairs right out in the open, with the sand blowing about and everything else. So it was, there was very much an ad hoc uh, bailing wire and duct tape approach uh, to these bases. Uh, bed sheets would be used to form aircraft skins. They would take old advertising signage and chop it up to make metal shims and other components for the engines. Somehow they made it work. It's, it, it's really a, either a miracle or a testament to aeronautical engineering that we only had 26 people killed in this entire operation uh, and not more. It, it, to me, that's, that's really an incredible uh, statistic considering just how limited resources were. Uh, even survival gear, we improvised our own survival gear. Hmm. So in some cases, we would try and get uh, tire inner tubes. And mind you, under rationing, a tire inner tube is not going to the auto parts store and buying one. It's back to that whole issue of requisitioning, uh, everything was controlled. So they would were constantly pleading or trying to get uh, inner tubes that they would then attach a canvas bag to and form what was called a barracuda bag. And the idea was if you had to ditch in the ocean, you pull this out of the back of the plane, get in the water and sit with the inner tube around you with your legs down in the sack. And in theory, this would keep sharks and barracudas and other fish from uh, sampling you, if you will. Uh, for either lunch, breakfast, or dinner, I guess, depending on your time of your patrol. Uh, it, was, it was an incredibly ad hoc uh, operation, but, but it, worked. Uh, yeah. it worked. And, and thankfully, we do not have these supply issues today. <laughs> <laughs> thankfully, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Well, but, and I, I guess your aircraft are slightly less vulnerable to cattle eating them. That too, yes. Uh, the, thankfully, we don't have those issues either. <laughs> but but it, was, it was a serious problem, and I, I come back, to the summer of 41, Arnold said the existing resources, you know, we, the military really kept to that uh, consistently throughout the war, uh, as I said, and at least for the Coast Patrol operation. And uh, the, 
to say the Coastal Patrol, you know, burned itself out, it, it's, it shouldn't be viewed as that's a failure of the, of the civilians. That's really a failure of CAP's national leadership, which were uniformed Army Air Forces personnel, that they did not act sooner to address the potential supply issue. And one could say that was because they never intended or thought, perhaps, that this effort would expand to 21 bases. It, supply was not a problem when you have three, four, or five bases. But when you have 21 and you expand from a couple hundred people to a couple thousand people and, and, hunt, and over 400 aircraft operational at a given time, if you, do, if you don't even think about the logistics of that operation from day one, which they really didn't, uh, that becomes a you can see how that problem can just snowball. And it really yeah. did. And it really manifests itself beginning in the fall of 42 when they have all 21 bases up. And yet, remarkably, they kept it going despite everything, to, despite the, the, the endurance of the war and the supply problems, they still found a way to make it work. And I, I think that's a, an incredible legacy uh, for CAP then and now. Uh, and just a kind of a, a testament to a human character, perhaps. The, the, there's a bit of daring do in all of this, and the, these men and women definitely had it. So I guess uh, that probably brings us on to our final question, which is that if people want to learn more about the history of the CAP, um, given that if they've been interested in the content, where do we go? <laughs> there so is a book. There's a fantastic new book out by some guy named <laughs> Frank Blazic, uh, called An Honorable Place in American Air Power, Civil Air Patrol, Coastal Patrol Operations, 1942-1943, and published by Air University Press. This book is absolutely free. So if you go to Air University Press's website, dramatic pause, because mm. I don't have a... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> there, there will be a link appearing <laughs> on the screen right yeah. now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if, if you go to airuniversity.af.edu and you search under an honorable place in American air power should be able to find the book and you can download it as a PDF. You can also, uh, you can request a print copy of the book as well. If you email the press, uh, they, they can ship you a copy of the book uh, free of charge to add to your library and for your reading pleasure. In addition to that book, there are other resources available. If you'd like to learn more about the contemporary organization, you can go to gocivilairpatrol.com. In terms of other historical literature about CAP, the Shameless Self-Promotion is the book I recently published is really the first scholarly attempt to talk about the Civil Air Patrol, Coastal Patrol operation in the Second World War. But there are some other books out of print but available in used sources that are fantastic uh, pieces of research. Oh, most prominently is a book by Lewis E. Kiefer titled From Maine to Mexico with America's Private Pilots in the Fight Against Nazi U-Boats. And it's really a collection of oral histories uh, put together. Uh, this was published in the 1990s when a lot of these men and women were still with us. And it's a collection of oral histories covering all 21 coastal patrol bases. A fun story in the course of researching my book, I came across two works published, one during the war and one afterwards. Uh, the first by William B. Meller is called Sank Sane and was published in 1944. Uh, Meller had been approached by the U.S. Navy, actually, to write a book about not just the Civil Air Patrol's contribution, uh, but also the Coast Guard Auxiliary and other uh, civilians who volunteered their time and effort in the Battle of the Atlantic. Meller's book didn't really sell very well. In addition to, to Meller's book, in 1948, uh, Robert Naprude published a book that began while working for the War Department, it was actually published by Civil Air Patrol called Flying Minutemen, the Story of the Civil Air Patrol. Curiously, in about, 19, I think it was 1950, uh, Meller learned of Naprude's book and attempted to sue Naprude for plagiarism. And Naprude actually agreed to settle out of court uh, rather than take the matter to court because Meller could have sued Naprude for damages greater than the budget CAP had in the banks at the time. So, Naprude heavily plagiarized Meller's accounts of the Coastal Patrol operation. So fun, fun little tidbits you discover while researching. Uh, but Robert Naprude's book, looking beyond the borrowed chapter on Coastal Patrol from uh, William Meller, 
is a good overview of kind of the wider missions that CAP was engaged in during World War II. Readers, though, will probably be a bit frustrated because you're not going to find any uh, source notes. You're not going to find any reference to documents or you know, so forth and so on. In terms of the book I published, though, for those who obtain it and would like to learn more, a lot of the materials I used are, are being collected and organized at the Civil Air Patrol History Center I run called the Colonel Louisa S. Morse Center for CAP History. And you can learn about us at history.cap.gov. And in some cases, you can download the primary documents. So we're trying to digitize, and by we, unfortunately, it's really myself at this time, but I'm trying to digitize as much content as possible and make it publicly available there on the web uh, for anybody's research use. The other fantastic repository of Civil Air Patrol documents, wartime documents, is the Air Force Historical Research Agency, which is the United States Air Force's archive located at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. The CAP records they have, and almost every case, have been microfilmed, and it is possible to request uh, PDFs of the digitized microfilm for your research purposes. There are still plenty of fantastic stories to be told and additional research to be conducted on about CAP's operations during the war. The Coast Patrol just happens to thankfully be the, the best preserved story during the war of, of one of CAP's operational missions. And even there, unfortunately, we really have but a pittance of documentary evidence still with us to this day. Hopefully, uh, a, a dish, this book will in, in, encourage people to dig in their crawl spaces and attics and, 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 and closets and bring forth forgotten records and forgotten information. Uh, so perhaps a revised edition will be on the, be on the horizon. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.